Good evening and welcome to the St. Louis Sioux for our science seminar series. The students, we can't have you sit there at Brakes Fire Code. There are plenty of seats over here, so please come in. And if some people don't mind, maybe even scooting in towards the center, so if we do have some other latecomers coming in, it's easier for them to find a seat. This is great that on such a blustery night that we have a good turnout. I've noticed that we have a lot of new high school students here tonight, and we encourage you to come to others. My name is Jim Jordan. I'm the Curator of Education here at the St. Louis Zoo, and it's with great pleasure that we continue to co-facilitate the Science Seminar Series with the Academy of Science. I want to mention a couple other opportunities coming up also. Next Tuesday night, if you're free, we have a free program by Dr. Gladys Kalima. She is the replacement, if you will, for Dr. Diane Fossey studying mountain gorillas. She's on a U.S. speaking tour, and we're fortunate enough to bring her here, and it's a free program. It starts at 7 p.m. next Tuesday evening, the 9th, and we invite you to come and hear more about this endangered species. Also, we have some programs, conservation conversations. And in the past, we had a charge for them, but now we're offering them for free. And in January, uh, and hold on a second. I need to find the date. Give me a second. And, okay, January 21st, Ed Spivak, our curator of invertebrates, is going to be talking about bees and pollinators. So more than just the honeybees, looking at the native pollinators, and many of you know that there's been a crisis with pollinators, especially with the honeybees in the U.S., and it really affects our ability to produce food. So. Those are two programs being offered through the zoo for free, and we're halfway through our science seminar series. Our next one, January 14th, in the wee small hours, the life in forensics, get here early. All of our forensic ones fill up. So if you want to have a seat, we encourage you to come maybe like quarter after seven or earlier, and Mary Case, and Christopher Long representing uh, the St. Louis County as well as other uh, county. Uh, she's a medical examiner and professor of pathology is Christopher Long at St. Louis University. We'll be talking about forensics. So lots of great programs coming up and I'm going to introduce Rose Jansen with the Academy of Science to tell you about tonight's program. Uh, as Jim said, my name is Rose Jansen. I'm with the Academy of Science St. Louis, and I'm going to take just a moment for those of you who are not familiar with the Academy to tell you a little bit about who we are. Uh, we are a local nonprofit, and we have been serving the St. Louis community since 1856. We have a long standing mission to advance the public understanding of science and inspire the next generation of scientists and science advocates. And we continue to celebrate more than 150 years of community service by offering a broad range of free and low-cost public science programming, collaborative seminar series, trips and tours, highlighting science at venues throughout the region. And you can find more on the Academy and our community-wide events and programs by visiting our website at academyofsciencestl.org. You can pick up some of the literature that's on the membership desk on your way out tonight. There's information there on upcoming events, seminars, programs. And uh, there are some e-news sign-up sheets that will make their way around the audience tonight. So feel free to put your name and or email address or snail mail address on those if you'd like to receive, um, again, upcoming notification of events and programs of both the Academy of Science and the St. Louis Zoo. And we don't share your name with any other organizations. So with that, I'm going to introduce tonight's speaker. 
Uh, tonight's speaker, Dr. George Johnson, earned his MA in biology and biochemistry from Dartmouth and his PhD in population biology from Stanford University. He is a fellow of the Academy of Science St. Louis and professor emeritus of biology with Washington University in St. Louis, where he taught biology and genetics to undergraduates for more than 30 years. He is a student of population genetics and evolution, a renowned uh, for his pioneering studies of genetic variability, and is the author of more than 50 scientific publications and seven texts, including biology, with the Missouri Botanical Gardens, Dr. Peter Raven, The Living World, and a widely used high school biology textbook, Holt Biology. And many St. Louisans are already familiar with Dr. Johnson as the author of a popular weekly science column on science featured for a number of years in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and now available online through the St. Louis Beacon at stlbeacon.org. He is the founding director of the zoo's Living World Education Center, responsible for the development of a broad range of innovative high-tech exhibits and an array of new education programs. So we are very pleased to have Dr. Johnson here with us tonight to talk about Darwin and DNA, what genomics tells us about evolution on behalf of the Academy of Science St. Louis and the St. Louis Zoo, won't you please welcome Dr. George Johnson. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I realize coming in, it's been almost exactly 20 years since the last time I spoke from this platform, the day this building opened. Uh, and it's good to be back. I'm sorry it's been so long. Um, the zoo's done very well without me. Uh, what we're going to do tonight, it's sort of fun to see as many students here as there are, uh, is not going to be an address, it's going to be a lecture. Because I figured out preparing for this that I'm constitutionally unable to talk for more than about 45 or 50 minutes. And so I've tried to make a longer talk, but that's what you're going to get. And that's why you got this. I have talked with this stick in every lecture I've given for 34 years since I first gave one. And it's my Linus blanket. I can't live without it, so you're going to find me waving it at you. If anyone approaches me too fiercely, I'll stop you. <laughs> so, yes? I I am not turned on. It seems like it's turned on. I think this is on. Well, what do I do to kill it? There you go. No, no, no. You're on. Okay. Let me see the. Red light. You're on. I'm okay. on. He said he, you weren't on. He lied. <laughs> They're just trying to interrupt me. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, what we're going to do tonight is talk about this guy here, Charles Darwin. And there's a very good reason for that. I mean, there are many things I could have talked about when they contacted me. I would love to have talked about adult stem cells, where there's a lot going on. There's not a whole lot going on. You might argue about Charles Darwin, and you'd be wrong about that, which I'm going to show you tonight. But the big reason is that Jesus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Boy, am I ever wired for sound. Uh, the big reason, of course, is that Chuck's birthday is coming up. On February 12th is Darwin's 200th birthday. So it seemed a good time to, to go back and revisit Darwin's work a little bit with a very special thing in mind, and that is a lot has happened in evolution, and particularly in the last five years. And so it's very, very interesting to look at new molecular data in terms of what we think about Darwinian evolution. It's particularly interesting because in this state of Missouri, like some others, intelligent design is an alternative idea often talked about. So we have to talk about it tonight because the molecular data has a lot to say about it. So, I think also it's, it's only fair to say that Darwin's a bit of a hero of mine. I told my daughter that I thought he had influenced Western thought more than any other individual. She popped right back at me, Shakespeare, Jesus Christ, and of course there are others. But certainly he's among a small number of people that's had a major influence on Western thought. And in my mind at least, the big influence is this. It's not that, hey, kids, species are formed by natural selection. I mean, he did say that, but that's not where he impacts Western thought. It's the general idea that human beings are one thread in a tapestry of life on Earth, and only one. That's his great contribution, I think, to Western thought. It has a great deal to do with how we look at the environment, or should do, 
I mean, as we start to screw it up more and more and our climate starts to change, the idea that we're part of a bigger world where we ought to pay attention to the other parts of it becomes more important. So Darwin is at least as important for those reasons as any other. Okay, the, I'm not going to give you a course in evolution here for the kids that don't know a whole lot about it. His ideas are very, very simple. It's that you start out, make this thing work, with a, uh, understanding that the world is very, very different in different places. This is the Galapagos, one place that Charles Darwin went. Struggling up this mountain with a lot of effort is a large tortoise. And what Darwin basically said was living in different places presents different challenges. And to live in the Galapagos is very different from living in New Jersey or, or some London, I guess he would have said. And that this particular tortoise has the challenge of surviving in that environment. And to survive well, you have to be at least as good as the other tortoises or maybe a little better. And that finally those torti, better able to to live with the challenges of living in the Galapagos will leave more children. And that over time, the tortoises of the Galapagos will look more and more like those more fit individuals. And he called that natural selection. It's a simple idea, not very complicated. And he said over time, as this goes on, these tortoises in the Galapagos will get to be so different that they'll be a different species than other tortoises. And that's it, that's Darwinian, Darwinian evolution in a nutshell, it's a pretty simple nutshell. I can tell you that uh, that was explained to me just much about that way this year. That's me, if you can barely see me here. And that's me 40 years ago on my first field trip as a biology graduate student starting my thesis work in the Rocky Mountains. I worked on alpine butterflies of all things. And what I wanted to say, the reason I put that picture up is really not advertising, it's rather to point out to you my bias, which is that from that day till this day, I'm an absolutely convinced Darwinist. So there's my bias, I'll admit to it, you can see it coming. So, what I want to do then is go on and talk about Charles Darwin, but I also want to point out to those of you that haven't figured this out yet, that this is a Missouri audience. And Missouri is like a lot of other states, there are plenty of people that don't think Darwin is such a swift idea that evolution is right. There are a lot of people who feel like this guy. This is a cartoon, a famous one actually, called Darwin Meets His Relatives. And um, the point I want to make here is that there are plenty of perfectly rational, reasonable people that don't believe in evolution. That believe in other things like, and we'll talk about one of them tonight, intelligent design at some length before we're done. And I don't intend this talk to be a review of that controversy or to settle it or even to get into it very much. And understand the reason for that too. I'm a biologist. Among biologists, there is no controversy. Darwin is as supported by data as anything in science is. Scientists believe in evolution with the same certainty that they believe in gravity or electricity. So that the creationist intellectual debate, or if it is a debate, is an issue of sociology, not science. And, and we'll get into that in some degree when we're done. But what I want to do tonight in this lecture is focus on just one thing, DNA, Darwin and DNA. The idea being that, and we'll walk through these ideas in some depth, that if Darwin's right, then his theory makes a lot of predictions which have never really been directly testable before. They've been indirectly tested, and Darwin's come out just fine, thank you. But with DNA, we can actually start to look directly at what's going on, and we're going to try to do some of that tonight. Okay. Now, the whole thing that made what I'm going to do tonight possible was the Human Genome Project, and I didn't see this coming. When they were starting to, Watson was asking for money to fund this, I thought it sounded like a good idea for medical reasons, for medical research. It never occurred to me the impact it would have on the study of evolution. And the reason is, once you know the complete human genome, a genome, by the way, for the uninitiated, is all the genes in your body, all the DNA in your body. And once you know the sequence of all the DNA in a human body, it's not very difficult to look at other vertebrates, which are pretty similar. And what's happened in the short seven or eight years since we've had a workable human genome sequence, we've gotten pretty good sequence information on all sorts of animals. 
And as you'll see tonight, particularly among the vertebrates. And this has allowed us to ask very specific questions. And also allows us to address in a very specific way, and I'll do this, the current fashionable version of Darwinism is wrongism, which is intelligent design. So I'm not going to get to that till a bit later. First, we're going to look at DNA evidence directly and see where we get. So we start with Chuck. Darwin here, he's an old man. This picture was taken the year before he died. It was only, the picture was only unearthed about 10 years ago. And he said that year, the fact of evolution is the backbone of biology. Now that's just what I said a few minutes ago. I mean, so it seems like the right place to start this kind of a talk. So let's start with that. Is Darwin right? Is evolution, in fact, a fact? And we can answer that question now. So to answer it, or to even to address it, what I want to do is start where Darwin started, with a clearly defined hypothesis that we can test. So Darwin defined evolution in such a clear and simple way that there's no way to improve on it. He said evolution is descent with modification, just three words, down through the families, through the years, with changes in the genes as you go, descent with modification. So what he means is that one species over time changes and may include in, among its descendants enough change that you get a new species every once in a while. That's the whole idea. Now the fossil record already is full of plenty of examples of this. And the one I love to, to give is this one. These are whales. Now, you know, if you all read the New York Times or other good science pages, you'll have read about these. You start out with a hooved mammal about the size of a pig each grass runs around and goes oink or whatever those kind of animals meant. Then from that you get about some 50 million years ago, a, a, something that probably looked a lot more like a uh, sea lion. It's got legs still, but it swims. It's got fins, but the legs are both all fully functional. From that you get another creature which still has its rear legs. They're all articulated, but they're no longer very functional. It's more like a rear fin that's pretty attached. Then you get a fellow that's still got most but not all of the bones, but they're no longer articulated to anything. And finally you get a fellow that has nothing but the hip bone floating out there articulated to nothing, and that's a modern whale. Now there's a clear progression through the fossil record. In this case, I've drawn it like a straight line, although as you'll see in a minute, that's probably not the normal case. So we have, well, before you even got to DNA, a pretty good record of evolution in the way Darwin talked about it. Now about that straight line business, this is a page from Darwin's own notebook in 1837, where he's sort of sketching out for himself how he feels evolution by descent should look. So you start out with something, and you go along and you get various other somethings. You can get a whole array of things, all of which go extinct. Still humping along here and you get several more lines extinct. It's like a bush in which most of the branches have no flowers. And finally, way at the top up of there, B, you get the thing that we have now. And I love that particular diagram because that's almost a perfect diagram of human evolution. I'll show you. So you start with this guy. This is a teenager. He's 1.6 million years old. He is not Homo sapiens. He is Homo ergaster, if you want to accept that. He's a Homo erectus form. And he's part of this phylogeny. And I'll to walk you through this. You start with a single form down here. You get a branch that goes extinct, another branch that goes extinct, and then a whole bush over here that goes extinct, just like that bush in Darwin's diagram. And then you go along over here, and you're working your way up through another bush. And finally, at the very top, only one survives, which is us. Now, if you go back and look at that, it's just sort of this isn't important, but it's just too much fun not to do it. If you look at this thing, so here's that first little bit. Here's the big bush that all went extinct. <laughs> and you go up through that array of bushes, and you end up with one on the top. It's just like what we have. Isn't that neat? I think that's fun. OK. That said, the, the, it's going to lead to something, all that talking leads to something very important. As you go through a long line of those evolutionary changes, 
And I just put a bird up here because I like birds. And that's a scarlet tanager. And that bird evolved from whoop, back one, please. That guy. It's dark enough what you can see is this is a dinosaur fossil. It's a coleophesis, which is the kind of dinosaur from which birds almost certainly evolved. But between this and the bird is a long series of changes. Now, they add up over time, is the point. So if you wait for a long, long time, there, are lots of, there should be a lot of changes in the DNA, which you should be able to see. So you can ask yourself the following simple question. If you look at the DNA, can you see the traces of evolution? And so what we're going to do is, well, just as a simple thing, that bird there, that bird should be more like you than a fish is like you. Now, why is that? It's because the fish evolved separately from the, the common ancestor between you and a fish is a lot older than the common ancestor between you and a bird. And you'd expect to be a lot more like me than a bird. For what reason? Because you're a lot more closely related to me than you are to a bird. That's a testable hypothesis because we have DNA data to look at. So we're going to test it right now. So we're going to start with this. This is a vertebrate phylogeny. You don't have to memorize it, but it makes a real important point. If you look at humans over here, humans are more closely related to chimps and macaques and baboons and marmosets to all the monkeys than they are to a rat, except for a few, and mouses. So because basically all the humans are primates, all the humans and monkeys are all primates, whereas the rodents are a whole different order. And indeed, so are cows and dogs and, and so on. Dogs or cats are in there with the dogs. So each of these orders is more like each other than any of them are to a fish, which is a whole different class. So you see what phylogeny gives you? It's a shorthand way of putting a bunch of animals down on paper, 14 in this case, and saying which is more closely related. And as I'm going to point out to you more, more, in more of a point in a minute, it's sort of an assumption. We're building into this the whole idea of taxonomy, which I'm going to walk away from in a minute, but we'll start with it. So we can say then, if you look at the DNA, what you would predict, if Darwin was right, is that these two people, these two critters, would be a lot more similar in their DNA than either of them is to a baboon, and a whole lot more similar than either of them is to a mouse. You see the general thrust of it? It's a very simple way to test a very important idea. So how do you do it? Well, obviously what you would like to be able to do is take the whole genome of each and every one of those and compare them. But that's a bit of a mouthful. I mean, when you think about it, human DNA is pretty large. And there's an awful lot of information in one genome. And multiplied by you know, 18 kinds of vertebrates, that's an enormous amount of information. And but the, the answer to that is, I'm not the only person to ask this, ask this kind of question. So the National Science Foundation, long since, long since being five years ago, figured out that they better find a way to search the human genome efficiently. So what they did was they funded an effort which is, takes place in Santa Cruz, California, University of California, Santa Cruz, the National Human Genome Research Institute. And what these guys did, not casually, but for, working together with all the different research molecular scientists in the country that work on these sort of things, they picked specific little bits to look at. The, the 44 of them entirely, in, in, in total, they called them the ENCODE regions. Together they represent about 1% of the whole genome. And the reason they were so careful to pick them is they in, are intended to be totally representative of the whole genome. It's not just the sexy parts with good genes, some of these uh, ENCODE regions have nothing but junk signals on there, as we can tell. So it's meant to show just about as much ENCODED stuff, about as much junk, about as much uh, regulatory stuff as the whole genome does. So it's meant to be totally representative, but it's only 1%, so it's a lot easier to look at. And the next part of my discussion, you have to know me a little bit to understand, and that is that I have no, um, I'm not very shy when it comes to figuring out this sort of stuff. So I called them up on the phone and got a hold of them <laughs> directly. And so I talked to the people doing this and asked them if they would do a little, help me a little bit. 
And they said, sure. And so for each of these vertebrate species, I asked them to run a number for me through their computer databases, because they have the databases of all these genomes at their disposal. And I asked for a very simple number. I said, will you give me the percentage of all the DNA that base to base to base is the same as a human for a chimp? Or for, in fact, for all of those, for a cow. For a cow, if you run the DNA genome side by side, what percentage is the same as a human? Very straightforward question. How similar are you to a cow? Well, we're going to find out. So they did that for me. And when you do and look at the answer, you get an interesting, very interesting result. It's the same slab, but now you have numbers. Now, I know they're not easy to read, but it says here that for these 44 regions, a chimpanzee is 91 percent that bases are exactly the same as the human genome. Now, the truth is, for the whole genome of a chimp, it would be more like 98. But for the ones that we're looking at, that's the number you get, 90, 91. Then as you go to the primates that are less closely related, you get in the 70s. If you go all the way over past the primates to a different order, the rodents, you're in the 36, 38 range. And indeed, all of these different orders are all in the 30s. And then if you jump to a different class, you're down in the single digits and indeed get all the way down to two. So what's that tell you? It tells you that Darwin's flat damn right, I mean, on this, <laughs> that the differences in the DNA nicely reflect the difference in phylogeny. Now, if you were really clever and didn't much like Darwin, you would jump up and point out to me that I just fudged it a little bit, which I did, because uh, Darwin's theory didn't predict that. You can infer that from what he predicted, but what he predicted was that the number of changes would increase over time, not over phylogeny. So if you're going to believe, to accept this as proof, you have to believe all this. And the nice thing is you don't have to. You can absolutely can avoid that and get right back to the prediction, and here's how you do it. The thing is that these are not unknown organisms. The vertebrates are among the most studied organisms in biology. And we have a very good fossil record of them. And all of these fossils are dated. For each one of these fossils, some are working on a fossil possum. There's this scientist somewhere who loves possums, who spent a lot of time looking at fossil possums and dating them. And then for, oh, I don't know, pick a, a chicken. There's got to be a, a lot of chicken bio, bird biologists who've worried about how birds evolved. And there's lots of fossils dated. So what you now can do is let's take the chicken. You can take a chicken and say, how closely related is that chicken to a human in terms of the DNA? Well, the answer is 7%. That's right there looking at you. And for time, what you ask is, how old is the common ancestor of a human and a chicken? And you can do that. I mean, that's a known thing. So here we go. Here's a if you will, a philosophy presented as a cladogram, and you, here's a bird, it's not a chicken, but it's a bird. We'll take it as a chicken-like organism. And you go down through there, and there is a mammal, it's a tiger, not a human, but again, for first approximation. You come down there, and lo and behold, you come to that point. And that point is the common ancestor of chickens and humans. And the, uh, the scale is known, but it's about 250 million years ago. In fact, we know what it is. It's this guy here. Isn't he cute? He's called a, it's a dininodont. And it's um, not the most impressive critter in the world, but we have a good fossil record of it. So what we have now, if you think about, every scientist loves to make a graph. If you think about a graph, for this point, the common ancestor, this guy here, establishes the common ancestor between birds and humans as 250 million years ago, because that's when he lived. So you've got a graph with a 7 for difference and 250 million years for time. You just do that every single one of those 18, and you get the following. And I love this one. Here are the birds, 250 million years ago, 7%, and here's all the other guys. And it's a goddamn straight line. I mean, I was explaining to my family about this. I said, look. You know, they know me perfectly well. I don't go to church every day, but I'm a religious person in my own way. And I really believe that there is some kind of divine 
person up there somewhere having a lot of fun with us who's designed the world, the universe, to run the way it does. And whoever that guy is, he's yelling in my ear. I mean, look at this. So there's no way to get a result like that and not say that the human genome is getting more different with time. The, the vertebrate genome is getting more different with time. Start out with very little differences with those who evolved not very long ago, a common asteroid from us very long ago. But the longer it's been that we've been evolving independently of the other critter, the more difference there is. And there just is no way to get around it. And even, I mean, <laughs> straight lines are rare in, in biology, believe me. So when you get one, you love it. OK. So that's the first thing I wanted to say tonight about Darwin and DNA. That on the first most basic level, we're going to go to some less basic levels, but for the first most basic level, it's to my mind an established fact that evolution occurs. It's an observation. That's not a theory, and it's sure telling a guess. I mean, that's a beautiful line that tells you that Darwin was flat right when he called evolution a fact. OK, now, you can have a little bit more fun if you look at a rather different level of evidence. You see right here that, that change accumulates with time. But if Darwin's right, and these changes represent descent with modification, he's actually saying a good deal more than just that. He's saying that these are not total replacements by someone like an intelligent designer but rather modifications of existing DNA by adding changes. If that's so, you should be able to see the evidence of the old forms in the new DNA. Our DNA today should have traces of our evolutionary past still there. It's what I call to my students Darwin's footprints. The DNA ought to be loaded with evidence of past forms, if you can look for it. And we're going to do that right now. OK. So what I'm going to do to explain it to you is start out with something which I probably wouldn't have chosen if I knew there were so many students in the audience, because it's a little hairy, but not too bad. When I'm going to pick something about animals that's so fundamental to the evolution of animals that you can't walk away from it. It's one of the most fundamental things about animalism. And that is a question about how we develop. Now, you know, development, and development in the sense I'm using it is from embryo to adult. From when you start out with a fertilized egg to when you walk out of the room, those events in my book are going to be development. Well, what I want to talk about, the way, the way you do it, the invention, is to carry out embryonic development not as a process, but rather as a series of subroutines, each independent of the other subroutine. Why is this important? Being able to break the process of development up into component parts allows the animal to run some of their subroutines in one part of the body and different subroutines in a different part of the body. So for the first time, different segments of the animal body could have different parts, different structures. And that's how come we can have legs and heads and a butt and all these sorts of things, because our development allows different segments to develop differently. And that was a very key advance in animals. And believe it or not, the whole thing is run by a handful of genes. There's a small subset of genes, and I don't know why they're called this, but they are. They're called Hox genes, H-O-X. And the Hox genes act like a series of switches. They don't make anything themselves. They control things. And they activate alternative programs in different tissues. And we're going to look at that and watch it. So here we are, we start with this, because it's easy to see how it works first when it was first discovered in a fruit fly. That's our fruit fly, Ralph. And he has a chromosome. All these genes are in one cluster on one chromosome. There are not all that many of them. And then you can see the way it works. That gene controls this part of the, that segment, which controls the mouth parts of the fly. And then you've got a gene that controls those segments, which controls the abdomen, the butt end of the fly. And you've got the and Tenopedia went here that controls this part in the wings, and so on. And the nice thing to see here is that those genes are in the same damn order as the fly is, which is, I guess it doesn't have to be that way, but it's sort of interesting. Now, the fun part to look at while we're going here is look at mammals. Now, this isn't a human, it's a mouse, but genetically speaking, we're in the same ballpark. And just like a mouse, humans have the same Hox genes on their four sets of them 
on four different chromosomes. And notice they're in the same order as they are, which is pretty wonderful. But here's where the molecular data gets wildly convincing to me. And this has only been done the last couple of years. If you sequence the DNA sequence of each Hox gene like this one and compare it to the fruit fly, they're the same. If you take this one and compare it to the fruit fly, it's the same. We have exactly the same developmental toolkit in all animals. Isn't that incredible? It is to me. <laughs> and so what you see there, there's Darwin's footprints and great big footprints. I mean, there's one thing, it only evolved once, and you find it in every animal. You don't find it anywhere else. Now there's another different way of doing this, for looking for Darwin's footprints. It's a bit more traditional, but it's going to come back to this DNA evidence. And that's looking at embryos. Now there was a, about 100 years ago, a guy named Haeckel argued that if you look at the embryos of different vertebrates, you see a lot of similarity. But his drawings were rather, he was helping his argument with how he grew his drawings, so he got himself in trouble. But his argument was right, even though the drawings weren't. Which is to say, if you just say it in a simple way, if you look at a reptile and a bird and a human, all of us have tails as early embryos. All of us have what amounts to gill slits. They are gill slits. What's that say? It says that part of the architecture has been preserved throughout all the vertebrates. But you can argue, I guess you could argue, hey, Dr. Johnson, you're being a little subjective here. You know, ain't that a little bit hard to see those gill slits to me? I don't see no gill slits or whatever. But there's a stronger way to make the same argument. And I can't resist it. And that is, you can look at the genes, those Hox genes I was talking about, and a lot of other ones involved in the development of vertebrate embryos. And guess what? They're all the same genes. They work in all the same order. And get this, they have the same DNA sequence, down to almost identical. So what does that tell you? That tells you that the entire toolkit to make your body form is the same in all the vertebrates. It evolved once and was preserved throughout the evolution of the vertebrates. Now that's a Darwin footprint with a vengeance. It's a really strong, for me as a molecular point of view, a very strong argument to be able to make. Okay, now, that comes the fun part if I don't kill myself here. Let's see. We don't need this one yet, I'll go back one. I'm going to talk a little bit about an argument that isn't mine, but I love it so much we have to go into it. And that is to, to answer an objection like this. What if someone came up to you and said, look, you know, maybe this is just a coincidence, you know? A butterfly and an eagle both have wings, but they're not related. It doesn't mean they're close relatives. Just because all these guys have the same changes doesn't really mean, could be just a coincidence, a big one, but a coincidence. So the guy I'm going to talk about who answering this is a professor at Brown University. His name is Ken Miller. I admire and respect him a lot because he spends a lot of his time explaining science to the public like I'm trying to do tonight, although he would, I'm sure, do a better job. But um, he answered this particular argument, I thought, very clearly. He describes an incident in his biology class where he sees on, during a test that two students are cheating. Because he sees one of them leaking over and looking at each other's work. And when he gets the papers, guess what? They're awfully similar. So he calls the students up after he's graded the exam and says, look, I saw you. You were cheating. They said, oh, no, 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 no. We weren't cheating. He said, we, they pointed out to Miller that they were roommates and that they studied together and they worked with the same set of notes. So it's not surprising that the answers are the same. But we weren't cheating. We didn't copy. So Miller does the following. He lays the exams out in front of the students. And he says, look at this. And six words are circled again and again on these exams with the red ink by Miller. These are six words that they misspelled. Both the exams misspelling each of the words always and in exactly the same way. And the point to look, there's only one way to spell a word right, but there's zillions of ways to spell it wrong. In every single instance, you both spell the same words wrong in exactly the same way. It cannot be anything other than the same source. And that's a very clear argument that anyone in this room can see. 
And here you have that here. There's no way in the world you get that much agreement when there's so many easy ways to not be in agreement unless they come from the same source. And that's the power of this Darwin's footprints argument. And it's, to my mind, a very powerful argument. Okay, now, I'm gonna give you a clearer, cleaner presentation of the same argument at the molecular level now. But it's gonna be the same as this. Now we can go to look at that diagram. Now what you have here is what a geneticist just calls a block diagram. These represent genes on a human chromosome. And in fact, what they represent, the shaded ones, are the beta globin genes on human chromosome 16. Beta globin is a protein that in an embryo and fetus and adult carries oxygen. But because it's a rather different condition being an embryo and being a fetus than being an adult, the protein has to function slightly differently. So your body through development starts off with this one then shuts that off and turns on these, uses those while you're a fetus. Then when you're born it shuts that off and turns on these, which you use as an adult. But if you sequence these genes, they're very, very similar in sequence. There have been very few changes to make these slight differences in behavior of the protein. Sitting in the middle of this cluster is something we call a pseudogene. Now a pseudogene is a gene that's just like the others, has very similar sequence, but it's got some mistakes. In this case, it has eight different DNA changes that make it non-functional, the way I'll show you in a minute. So this is a non-functional gene. It just sits there, doesn't make anything. Although it clearly is very similar to these others. Now, the fun thing to note about this is we humans are arrayed this, we're not the only ones. Gorillas and chimpanzees have exactly the same globin clusters arrayed very similarly with very similar sequences. Now, you look at the pseudogene in a gorilla or in a chimpanzee, have exactly the same eight mistakes, precisely the same as they are in a human. Here they have a single control region alteration, one nucleotide that stops the whole thing from being red, a defective start signal, single nucleotide mutation, in the start three, three uh, nucleotide codon for start. Here you got stop signals where there shouldn't be one, three different ones in different places, all done exactly the same way. Here's a stop signal, that's a codon that says stop, that shouldn't be there. Single nucleotide change. And a frame shift, I won't get into frame shift additions and deletions, but basically a frame shift is just a, removing one base in exactly the same place twice. Now that is a very, very hard to imagine ever, ever two happening exactly the same, but three? There isn't any reasonable way to see that data and conclude anything other than that they come from a single event, single common source. And what's happened is that we have not only carried over the globin genes, but carried over all the mistakes with them from a common ancestor of us in chimpanzees and gorillas. There isn't any other way to read it, as far as I can see. I think that's a very powerful statement about Darwin's foot. That's a footprint and a half. That's a very strong statement that looking at human DNA, you can see the ancestors of humans still present in that DNA. And there's a great place there for you to do. That had to have happened prior to the bifurcation that gave us gorillas and chimpanzees from humans. It happened in a common ancestor to the three once. And there's no other way, to, it's just like cheating on the exam. Think of these as misspellings on that student exam. And here's, there were two students, here there's three species, exactly the same argument. If you would convict those two students of cheating, you have to buy this, and should. Okay, we're not done yet. We should be done, but we're not. And the reason we're not is, now we're going to get back to intelligent design, is that you can say, look, all of this, including the footprints, is a test of your faith. And an intelligent designer just built it that way. And he says, I would say to them, how do you know that? And I say, the reason we know it is because we know that evolution by natural selection is impossible. And I look at them and I say, huh? And they say, look, and what they're gonna argue is that the machinery inside of a human cell is so complicated and so interconnected to other machines in the cell that you can never get there in a stepwise fashion from evolution, natural selection. That you couldn't select the pieces to get to the machine, 
machine would have to be created all at once. It was just too hairy for that to be. And the example that everyone always gives is this, a mousetrap. And they say, this mousetrap, they say, is irreducibly complex. And they mean something very specific about this, and I want to quote it to be fair. Uh, the proponent of intelligent design that gives you this definition is named Michael Behe. And he says, an irreducible complex system like this one is a single system composed of several well-matched interacting parts that contribute to the basic function, with the removal of any one of the parts causing the system to cease functioning. So there's a mouse trap, it's got five parts. You can't take any part away and catch a mouse. And so what B he's saying, and what intelligent design proponents are saying, is you can't evolve this with natural selection, because what would you do? You start with a platform, well, how can you, platform has not any function. How can natural selection act on it? If you remove any part, just remove, I don't know, the hammer. There's nothing to hit the mouse. So how could you evolve half of a hammer, half of a mouse trap? You have to have all five parts where it doesn't work. And you have to select them all at once where it doesn't work. And you can't select them all at once. And so it's impossible. So that, in essence, is the core argument of intelligent design. If you don't buy that one, there's nothing else in intelligent design to hang your hat on. So there's where they put their effort and where we're going to put ours tonight. We're going to look at that. I, my wife brought me this one which I'm not going to use tonight because it's a little large and I'll take my finger off with it. But we'll have a smaller one, which I will use here in a minute. Okay, so the example we're going to start with is the one that Behe starts with, which is blood clotting. Here you have some red blood cells and this tangle of fuzzy uh, green fibers is fibrin. This is a blood clot. And I can't and don't want to give you a, a course on how blood clots, but I'll tell you sort of how it works. You start with a very, very small interaction at the point of the clot. It can be a tear or various things. And one or two, small number actually, of proteins notice. And they do something, we're just going to not define them. We're going to say they do something to another protein. Now each one of them, I'm going to do it to you. I'm going to go, okay. And then what he does after I've whacked him one, is he starts whacking people. Now I do it to you. And she starts whacking people. So, so the first level, I've got a bunch of whackers. So each one of the people that you whack starts whacking people. You know, we get everybody in this room be whacking within a minute, you see, because it amplifies with every step. It's called a cascade. And the way blood clotting works is it goes through a series of 12 reactions, every step of which amplifies the cascades and makes it very powerful. Now, any one of those steps don't work. Blood doesn't clot. So B, he says, look, it's irreducibly complex. It's impossible for evolution to have given us the blood clotting cascade. All 12 are required, you don't get any blood clotting, he says. Now, there is a reason, how, there's a great fallacy in this argument. It has to do with the mousetrap that my wife brought me. And I love this part of it. Excuse me, stay there. This is a mousetrap, only it's not a complete mousetrap anymore because I've removed some parts. It doesn't have that little catcher anymore. It doesn't have that twanger. What it has is the base, the spring, and the whacker. And with this, as, uh, and I've got to give credit again, I'm not the first person to point this out, but I'm, I'm not going to do this because I was told it's not smart. But if I was angry at that, I could put a spitball on this, and I could go, whack! It's a weapon, and a pretty good one. Alternatively, this is more acceptable, it's a pretty good tie clasp. <laughs> not only that, but all the other parts have functions, although I'm not supposed to do this in public, but that little twanger, actually you can pick your teeth with it. Yeah. Now why, it's a ridiculous example, but it makes an important point, which is that the mousetrap is not irreducibly complex, only irreducibly complex as a mousetrap. But if it's built of parts which were selected for other functions, it's easy to see how you get a mousetrap. I selected me a very, very efficient tie clasp. I took my toothpicker, put that on it, with a platform, and I got a mousetrap. Now, it's, it's a ridiculous level argument, but it could turn out to be exactly right. I want to go back now and revisit blood clotting and show you how it really is. Now, here are the, here's the cascades for human blood clotting. The earliest part, which evolved, and you still find it in lampreys, is the only thing they have, and it clots blood for a lamprey, just not very well. 
is the common pathway, the last steps. And that will allow lamprey blood to clot. Some considerable time later, 100 million years later, you add a series of extra steps which amplify the reaction a lot because it's several levels of trackers, each doing it. Now any sort of a trauma will release factors from the broken cells which start several more stages to the cascade. Then even later becomes the really strong amplifying series of reactions which is really just kicked off by a rip in, in the cell surface. And so what you end up with, and there's one more little step added at the last one, which cross-links the fibrin. So what we're saying then is, and you look at the genes for these things, they're all related. What turned out that these genes, the 12 genes we're talking about, all have pretty much the same sequence. They've duplicated and changed twice. Uh, twice, two, two, four, and, yeah, twice. Two big rows of, rows of duplication, and then lots of changes, and you get this sort of a thing. So it's not irreversibly complex because the pieces worked just fine before the other pieces got added onto it. Does everyone see that? So that the idea, because you evolved this as this, it worked just fine if you're a lamprey. It wouldn't work so well for us, but it worked fine for them. And so that evolution evolves things in bits and pieces. Now there's a nicer, not a nicer, but there's a different way to look at it that's even more powerful for me. And that involves the second example that Behe and friends like to use for irreducible complexity. Uh, you might not figure this one out, but that's a bacteria. And those are flagelli. And a bacteria swims. Most bacteria are very with, with flagelli are very motile. And the way they swim is they take their flagellum and they rotate it round and round and round, just like a propeller on a boat. It's one of the very few rotary motors in nature. And you find it, these little bacteria, and you go, through the water very effectively. Well, if you look in detail at the molecular motor, and people have because rotary motors are so rare in biology that people find them very interesting. And this is what you get. Now, this is a drawing. I'll show you a photograph in a minute. The membrane sits right along these things, right about here. And the way it works is the cell in its metabolism generates protons. The same thing you do. That's how you get your energy out of food, too. You strip protons from your food molecules. And it spits them out through here. And every time a proton goes out, it's like a turnstile going click, click, click. This thing goes round and round and round. So if you spit them out, it goes round, 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 round. That's how this thing works. And it's a rather complicated engine. With, it looks like an electric motor in a way. It's got this thing. This has a shaft going down through the middle of this thing. And because this is fixed to the membrane, if that rotates relative to this, it's going to spin. And that's how it works. And what a complicated, beautiful little machine. And so B, he says, look, man, this is irreducibly complex. You kind of evolve all that in one step, he says. And remember what I'm saying back at him with my little mouse trap here is maybe you didn't evolve it in one. Maybe you evolved it from pieces that had different functions. And I'm going to show you one right now. Here we go. This is that bacterial flagellum again. Here's a real photograph of one. Now this thing is a type 3 secretory apparatus. Its function is totally different. It's in bacteria. It sits in the membrane just like that one does. And its function it doesn't rotate though. Its function is to move proteins across the membrane. It uses a trade-off with spitting out uh, uh, protons to do it. So the proton moving part of the machine was invented for a totally different function, much simpler machine. It hadn't got all these extra stuff on it. So what do we learn from this? That that flagellum is not irreducibly complex. That a major piece of it was already in existence doing something else. And there's lots of other examples. I'll mention one more without any pretty pictures. I just love it. It's an enzyme in, that we've recently, recently discovered about 10 years ago called nylonase. Now nylonase, as you might gather, is an enzyme that eats nylon. But think about that. Nylon is a totally artificial substance. There was no nylon before the Second World War. So where the heck did nylonase come from? Well, it turns out you can find it. You can actually get it yourself. If you go to any place that makes silk stockings or where they make nylon, and look at the dredges that they throw out the back door. You know, they don't tell you this, but there'll be ponds of this stuff. And it'll have a sludge on the top of it. And in that sludge, you can find bacteria living very happily. Well, there's nothing in the sludge but nylon. 
or the precursors of it. And so they, what has evolved there is a bacteria that can eat nylon. And right away, that's fun. But the really fun part is to say, where in the world? Isn't that sort of irreducibly complex? How did they come up with a whole enzyme to eat nylon out of nowhere? And the answer is it didn't come out of nowhere. It came out of a perfectly normal enzyme that does something else. And it turned out that two things happened. The first thing that happened was that that gene that did something else duplicated it. So there's two copies to play with. And then the extra copy had a frame shift mutation, a single change in the nucleotide in one place that made sort of a random change across, if you will, it's not really random, but for the sake of this audience, a random change across the gene that just happened to eat nylon. Now, you wouldn't, if you only did that once, of course, you would never get that result. But if you, there's lots of bacteria in a pond, and so if you try 100 million times, you'd get one. And so it turned out selection had generated that, and people have since reproduced that many times in the laboratory. If you challenge a bacteria with a carbon source like nylon, eventually the, the gene that will do this will do it, and you'll get it. So you get what seems to be a totally novel and new thing from an old thing, which is selected for different reasons entirely than the new thing. So again, you see the general argument, the great fallacy of irreducible complexity and of, therefore of intelligent design is to assume that everything has to be and always selected to be the way that things are now. But actually, if selection operates in the past on something to make something else, then simply puts that together in a different way to make what you have now, there's no problem at all. So there we have then two things tonight. The first thing is, I think, the evidence for descent with modification from at a molecular level is very solid. And number two, I think that the arguments against evolution, uh, basically the intelligent design arguments, are not solid because they're based on a fallacious piece of indirect argument. And there's no evidence for an intelligent designer, and the evidence that evolution doesn't work is no evidence at all. So the last point to make, and it's a simple thing, is if anyone cares a lot about this, I'm going to go back one, put that there. No, I didn't. There it is. Anybody cares a lot about this, there is a book. There is always a book. But in this case, Ken Miller, the guy I talked about, has just published a book. And this is a very detailed parsing of intelligent design. I didn't do a lot with it tonight. You can't in this kind of an audience, certainly not in the short period of time I'm talking. But he walks through the cases I've given you and many others in much more detail in that book. And it's fun to read. He's a good writer. So anyone that cares about it, that's a good place to go. And then to finish off, what we're going to do, go back to Chuck here, and just point out that uh, next November is the 150th anniversary of the publication of On the Origin of Species. And I always like to do this. See this one? I think The Origin of Species is a wonderful book to read, but I like this because I think it's as convincing now as when my grandfather read this volume, which I have. It's from 1888. It's been in my family since, and I treasure it. I think, though, that the sort of things you see tonight with DNA level just makes this that much brighter. You read this, it's just as enjoyable, and if Darwin had had this information, he would have loved it. Okay, I'm going to stop. Questions? That's a good question. Yes, the first question is how long did it take? Well, not bad. 45 minutes is what I said. Oh, I will. But the first question was, I said it would take 45 minutes. How long did it take? It took 45 minutes. Not bad. <laughs> it's a long habit. <laughs> okay, I'll take questions. No questions? Well, that's good. Okay, yeah. No, I did not memorize. I haven't memorized the book. I, I know what's generally in the book, and I've read it several times, but I didn't memorize it. But we have the book right here. We can look them up. Well, let's see if we have it. I'm willing to learn the 1888. This is the sixth edition, so if it's around. It's Wender, Butler, and Bacon. Bacon. To conclude, therefore, that no man out of a weak conceit of sobriety or an ill-applied moderation Think or maintain that a man can search too far or be too well studied in the book of God's work or in the book of God's works. 
divinity or philosophy, but rather let men endeavor as endless progress or proficiency in both. I couldn't agree more. Indeed, that's exactly the point of tonight's talk. You know, that you go on and look at the new world of modern molecular biology, you just learn more. I'm the most religious person in this room in my own terms. But it doesn't, I think it's a wonderful thing to have a creator that could design such a neat world that would give me a straight line and that sort of a thing. That sort of guy has really got a, it's a beautiful creation. And I think it demeans him to think that no, we have to design each little piece of it rather than designing a program that would make all of it. Now, oh, one question. Ah, oh, wait. No, I just. And whether those two would be very well active and disarmed. It's a hard, I mean, it's, it's not that it's a hard question, it's just it's hard to give you the answer you want, a specific one, because a pseudogene is any gene that's non functional. But because it doesn't function, doesn't make it disappear. Generally, pseudogenes are around for a long time, and in fact, a rather healthy fraction of all the genes in your body are non functional genes. But they can turn back if you're lucky. A pseudogene that's because of one frame shift or so, you could imagine reversing the frame shift, turning it back on, and that's their records where that may well have happened. But most pseudogenes have many errors, and you couldn't reverse them all exactly with any probability at all. So getting it, most pseudogenes turned back on is probably a zero probability event. Okay, so that's not the point being, is that pseudogene because, for example, used to be an extra globin gene. No, very few animals have globin clusters. Uh, that's a primate sort of a thing. And the primates all have the same sort of cluster we have. So whenever that pseudogene got inactivated, it was early in the cluster's evolution, probably at the stem of the primates. But if you go back past the primates, you don't have globin clusters. So you can't answer the question. It's a good question, but there isn't a clear answer to it. Pseudogenes are a fuzzy subject to study because you can screw things up in so many different ways, all of which give you one, and some can be reversed, most of them can't. But they can all tell you a lot. Because if you think about it, it's a blank a pseudogene is no longer being acted upon by selection. So it's a blank slate from where it came from till now with a few random changes. So it's a, they can tell you a great deal in a different way. Yeah? Twenty-two five is about the most recent number I know. Do you think that as we learn more of the human genome, that that number is going to continue to decrease? Or no, that that no. Happens? No, the number twenty-two five. We know the proteins involved in every case, and so no, that number's solid. But the point is, we're going to change what we think we're looking for. See, those numbers at the twenty-two thousand odd, twenty-two thousand genes are parts of the DNA that code for a protein. But that's going to turn out, especially in the last five years, to be way too narrow a definition of a gene. Because a lot of the interesting stuff is in the RNA, which no one had ever guessed. But it turns out that the information that we thought was junk information in the genome, a lot of it seems to have to do with producing RNA molecules with complex regulatory functions. And they're going to be very important. A lot of evolution will have happened there. Yeah. That's a good one. The question is, is Darwin further substantiated by the examples we see of evolution in microorganisms, especially when it affects your health? 
and sure. I mean, I almost thought about going into that tonight, but didn't have the time. It's perfectly clear that evolution occurs in microbial populations in a way that affects human health. Penicillin's a great example. There's a reason why penicillin's not such a good antibiotic anymore, but it used to be. And the answer is we used it a lot, and bacteria developed resistance to it. There's a reason why bird flu can come back and be dangerous again, or why flu, influenza can. Remember in the end of the, second world, end of the First World War that influenza killed more people than the war did. People forget that, but it's true. And it did it all in 18 months, which is quicker than the war was. And that same influenza virus, it's not like all of a sudden it became harmless. It's just that the variant that was dangerous then we're now resist, we are, we have evolved resistance to. But the problem is the flu virus keeps changing. And everyone who knows anything about this is scared by Jesus that it will evolve just enough of a difference that our immune system will no longer recognize it. We'll have another influenza pandemic. And that's just evolution, coevolution. It's changing and we're evolving resistance to it back and forth. And the only way to study it and the only way to deal with it is in the Darwinian evolutionary sense. Nothing else makes any sense. Yeah. Damn right. You see why? That's my favorite question to students. I'll ask, let me ask, answer the question you didn't ask, then I'll answer your question. The question you didn't ask is how come that's a, how come that's a log function? Let me give it back because it's so neat. This is a graph I like a lot. When I, when I got this result, I mean, it just kept me up for weeks just salivating. So here's the problem. You see it's 1, 5, see how it's getting 5, 50, and so why is that? The answer is if you're looking at something here, and that's an ancient ancestor of a bird. And here's a bird. There's a process of, uh, there's, a, there's changes going on between the ancestor and the bird at some rate, right? And if you look at that and going to me, to humans, there's a rate going on between me. But I'm not looking at the dickiodont and me. I'm looking at that bird. So it's two rates. It's the product of that rate and this rate. And because you've got the product of two rates, you put it on a log function. It gives you a straight line on the log function. Otherwise, you plot this normally, you, get a, you still get a relationship that's even more powerful, but it looks like this. You see, all that does is, is it doesn't put the points on the line, it just makes the line linear on a two-power function, two function. But the fact that the points are on the line, it doesn't do any of that. You see what I mean? So what this is, to do a log function, anytime you look at two things that are independently being acted upon, you have to, you've got two rates, you look at the product of the two. That's what that is. Questions? There's somebody over here. Okay. Miller writes lots of books. Yes. He's a very religious man, actually, and a very sincere man, but a good, strong proponent of evolution. Yeah, way in the back. I can't get a word of it. To be very honest, have I ever questioned my beliefs on evolution? To be very, very honest, yes and no. The, the no part, I meant that when I said 40 years ago I became a Darwinist and I still am. It doesn't mean I cease to think. And sometimes, initially, before the DNA evidence became available, it was sort of fashionable among people like me to talk about, hey, what if we're all wrong? Wouldn't that be neat? And um, at some level, when you're dealing with, if you see people working as paleontologists, fossils are not to be found whenever you go look, and they're rare. They're often very indirect evidence and so on. You're relying a lot on their judgment as to what this is and that is and so on. So you could sort of maybe say, tickle yourself a little bit on a hard night and say, well, you never know. But once you start looking at these data, then there's no doubt whatsoever. That's why I love the molecular aspect. The DNA with Darwin nails it for me. I don't see any way to get around that kind of data. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, it is true, nor did I today talk about the origin of species as a process. I mean, I could give a lecture on that, but that wasn't the issue on contention here. Not the details of how you make one, but are they, have they been made over time? And that, I think, we did address them very directly, as this book does. He had a big disadvantage over us. Darwin didn't have chromosomes. He didn't understand, no way he could have understood how reproduction works to get where he's going. He didn't know anything about mutation or DNA or chromosomes or any of that. He did pretty well considering what he had to work with. Questions? Yeah. Way in the back. You or yeah, you. <laughs> See, you're going to wave a lot. Then you <laughs> That's a good question. Can you comment on speciation among humans? That's, I think that's what your question was. There was a time before we got smart, when my wife was quite right about this, and put an exhibit hall over there for little children to learn about science. And I, and I love that, and I commend the zoo for it. But before that, it was filled with exhibits that I designed with a man named Chip Ray. And one of them was called Homo Nextus. And it was design your next species of human. And you could, and it was all meant with an ecological bent. It was a lot of fun. You could say, well, what do you think it's going to be like in the future? Is it going to be paler or darker? Well, it's going to be a lot hotter in the future. He'd be a lot smarter if he was darker. And then you go on and design other things, like how much hair he ought to have. He ought to have damn little because he doesn't want insulation. He wants the reverse, and so on. And you'd go on through and design yourself one. But what it didn't do is say, how do you get the species part of it? And the answer there is maybe you live in New Zealand, there's a nuclear war, and you don't communicate with anybody else or something. There has to be isolation as well to get a species barrier in a higher vertebrate. It's not true of a plant, but it's certainly true of a human. So what you would have to do is somehow make real sure as these changes go on over time that you don't whoop them out. But here's one more. There's a different way to look at it, which I didn't think about right now, but it's perfectly valid. What if you didn't have any species barriers, and, but all the people in the world changed? Well, if anyone from outer space came and compared what you'd be like in 100 years to what you're like in 100 years, they'd say it's a different species. Biologists do it all the time. When they find an organism that's consistent and looks very different, a botanist wouldn't, Peter Raven wouldn't hesitate to call it a different species. So it all depends what you mean by species. But if you mean one with a reproductive barrier, it's hard to get that in a human because we reproduce around so much. <laughs> uh, questions? Yeah. Uh, I read recently something about the uh, Pfizer uh, DNA oh, yeah. I uh, no, I mean I could, but I haven't. Re I read the article too, but I haven't got it clear in my mind. But the statement is an interesting one to make. He points out. I'll just say, questioner points out that uh, if you look at the DNA of a platypus, it's not the DNA of an organism in a normal sense. It's more like the DNA that a committee would put together. It's got whole segments of it that are reptilian, and very like parts of the reptilian genomes. And certainly a part that's very bird-like. Of course, birds and reptiles are pretty closely related. But then it's got a big mammalian hunk. And you could say, how in the world did that get there? And the answer, again, has to do with common descent. But things can change at different rates. So you can build a scenario to get to this. But it's not one you'd ever expect to have happened, but it did. Well, you couldn't because of the, the, DNA, the full genome stuff came out after this. The encode people had to do their encode sequences, so I couldn't do it. But if you did do it, it might be the sort of thing that wouldn't fit well because it does have large hunks in very different places. And so it's a very, very weird anomaly, the platypus. And I don't have any, I haven't got enough courage to try to say where it would be on that. Yeah. Oh, you're pushing my button. How, <laughs> how satisfied am I with the level of education about evolution in Missouri schools, I'll just say, schools? And that's a, at least a two-part answer. The first part, and both of them are not at all, but, but the first part has to do with the science standards in the state of Missouri. And I've written on this in the past, for any of you all that have read some of my columns, and that is if you go throughout the nation, state by state, and look at the science standards, what is what must be taught, what must be on the exams, excuse me, not what, what must be on the exams in high schools in your state. 
you can ask the simple question, is Darwin in the standards and how much? Or is evolution at all in the standards and how much? And most states in the Union, there's some of both of those things. There is, however, a great big black hole in the country in the middle of it, with Missouri square in the middle. But Illinois is just as bad. I mean, this, it's really strange. There are about six or eight states, and they aren't all Southern, where the evolution in Darwin are almost non-existent. Missouri standards, there is one standard, now we're talking out of 400 and some, that has the words evolution. The word Darwin is never mentioned, but the word evolution is in one standard. So it's not that it's not there, but they sure didn't work very hard at it. So that's the first part of my answer is, no, I'm not satisfied because we don't insist on the, the testing of it. The truth is, as you go around the state, most teachers teach it anyway, bless their hearts. But the second part of it is, is, is the other half of this coin where they might not be able to have such a freedom to do it in the future. Every year for the last five years out of St. Charles, and I won't name any names, there is a state representative who puts a bill in the legislature. It changes a little from year to year, but it always says something like this. It says students in Missouri will be required to learn what a theory is. And they will be required to, teachers will be required to differentiate between theory and fact. And it goes on like that. Basically what they want to do is say that evolution, they want to make room for non-evolutionary explanations. And the teachers should be allowed to give such a thing. Well, if it's a non-scientific, if it's a non-observational, I think non-observational was his last version, non-observational argument, that's intelligent design. And to tell the person that evolution is a theory, the theory of evolution is a theory, right? But tonight I tried to make the point it's not a theory, it's a fact. And under that law in my book, every teacher in Missouri would be required to teach that it's a fact, which wouldn't be so bad. But so basically I think we don't insist on the teaching of evolution in this state like we should, although most teachers do a very good job of teaching it anyway. But number two, we want to be very careful that in the, by the way, that bill passes out of committee to the full legislature the last two years. I mean, Missouri's one little step away from making that the law of the land. And so we ought to be careful with our legislators that they understand that we care about what we teach in our schools. And one thing we don't want to do is promote the teaching of intelligent design as if it were science. I would love to see it taught in religion, which is what it is. And it's sort of fun to have at it, like I was doing tonight. But you shouldn't think that intelligent design is science. It's pseudoscience pretending to be science, and that's all it is. Uh, next. Questions? Oh, yeah. Well, there are, depends, similarity can be measured in lots of ways. One is just DNA, how much, see if how much they will pair together. But what I'm doing here is a very specific thing. That's why I took the trouble to lay out the 44 encode sequences. Now, their, their 44 sequences may not be totally representative. In fact, you know they can't be, because humans and chimps were 91% when we know that they're 98 to 99%. It's just that you, you can't get it right when you went from 1%, you can't hit it perfectly. But he isn't going to miss it by 50%. I mean, they're not, they're not that far off. Yeah? I just wanted to say just one more quickie thing. You could get better, the more of it you looked at from 1% up, presumably the more they would approximate Orderson's final numbers when he's looking at the whole thing. He's only looking at two things, though, just us and chimps. When you want to do all that, it's a lot of work. So the 1% gives you close enough to see where you are. That's all. Yeah? That's another thing I've written about and I'm very interested in, but it's, it'll be hard to get it right in just one minute. The question is, what do I think about the evidence with Y chromosomes and mitochondrial DNA that humans came out of Africa, and then we'll say, in, and, and I will say what you're saying, I don't know if you said it or not, but I'll pretend you said it, uh, several times, as opposed to have evolved sort of once all over the world. 
And the idea here is that you can use a genetic marker like a, a change in the Y chromosome, which is not recombined every generation, and follow it from male to male to male in generations. And if you do that very carefully without telling you the analysis, and the same will be true of mitochondrial DNA, the result is very clear. It's not tenuous. It's not, we're beginning to think that way. It's flat, clear, that what happened was that humans evolved in Africa as one species, uh, well, not one species, but at the base of the tree is something like Homo erectus and started to move out. And it, we moved out several times, not once, and at least three times. And that finally, even you got some movements where you'd have a, a, a Cro-Magnon and Neanderthal living more or less together. It came out at different times. One didn't evolve from the other. They're like cousins. So it looks like our human tree, the last bit of it, was a bush, really, but with common roots in Africa. Humans didn't evolve in Asia. They evolved several different species in Africa, and each of several species went for a walk and walked out of Africa over to the rest of the world. No. But there's no Homo erectus skeleton so old as to be older than the thing we think it came from in Africa. Oh, I don't. Of course, it, the, what happens, you know what happens with paleontologists is, depends how you carve it up. But the, the plans I have, let me show you the one I have here. But This is, of, as of last year, is as close as I can get to it. There, that guy. Now you can walk through this. Uh, I, I, there's no way in this machine I can turn that sideways. I wish I could so you can read it better. But, but basically, this is the end of it we're talking about. And at several different stages in this, they got out of Africa, not just once. And I don't think there's any doubt about that. They came out of Africa as Homo erectus? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not, not after they went out. No, no, of course they can't be. Because it turns out the next species, Homo sapiens, also evolved in Africa. You see, all of these species, including us, all that evolution is taking place in Africa. And so if you, start, if you stand away from it in Israel, if you stand away from it in Asia, and look at what you see, you see ver several forms of human. They didn't evolve from one to the other in Asia, but their ancestors evolved one for the other in Africa. That's what it says. Oh, I know there's, piece of the, there's, there's people in Washington University that believe that fiercely, but they're wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry, but the data is very clear on this. But there was an argument about it 10 years ago, and I think both sides had, could make a fierce argument. So people went out, and, as you say, and got a lot of data very pointed data and reached a pretty clear conclusion. And I think it's fair to say it's pretty much of a consensus conclusion now. Quack. Yeah. But it's a name. It's not a thing. The name was given by the guy who discovered it. And he could have called it Ralphology, Ralph, Ralph Acid, and it would have been Ralph Acid, but it wouldn't mean it. It's just a name. Well, it's a salt or an acid, depending on how you treat it. But when Mishnah found it, it was an acid, so he called it that. It was nuclein because it was the nucleus and so on. But it's just a name. I mean, they didn't have to call it that. They certainly could have called it George, George Ace. I would have loved it, you know, or something. But no, the, 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 the DNA name, it's just a, it's a label. Are we done? Thank you very much for your trouble. Oh. So how do we do?